It was not until 2008 when I encountered the writings of the Eastern mystic Osho that I began to see, wow, I'm leading this false life. Now what do you do when you find something in yourself that you absolutely hate? Folks, how many of you would agree that in this room, if you started taking stock and looking inward, there would be many things you would see about yourself that you might not like about yourself? Raise your hand if you... Okay. Now, what do we do generally with those things we don't like about ourselves? We make New Year resolutions. And we say, I hate this about me. Right? And that's what we do. Now, I'm going to introduce you to a different tradition, but I need a volunteer. Uh, what's your name, sir? Frank. Frank, come on up here. I volunteered you for a small exercise. Folks, let's uh, thank Frank with all the capacity for gratitude at our command. Because if it wasn't for Frank, you would be up here. Frank? Thank you, Frank. Now, this demonstration is interesting. I asked, it comes straight from the Zen monasteries. I uh, requested Frank to come up here, and without saying a word, I started pushing against him. Did I tell Frank to push back against me? No. But what did Frank do? He started pushing against me. Then I backed off. What did Frank do? He backed off. Then I pushed again. He pushed back. We could have gone for the rest of the day, you know, doing this. It wouldn't be a very interesting seminar, but... You know, <laughs> it would be an artistic expression of why life sucks. <laughs> it's left to your imagination. Now, how many of you agree that this happens in relationships? If you're in conflict and you're pushing against somebody, they'll push back. And if you let them be, they will let you be. But in this demonstration, the Zen masters take it to a totally different level. Walk with me, if you will, all the way back to Frank. Frank now, in this demonstration, no longer represents Frank as a separate person but he represents that part of me that I am fighting against. So the idea here is that there are parts of us that we are in inner war against. There are parts of our personality that we are fighting against. For example, how many of you have struggled with the problem of procrastination, of being a procrastinator? How many of you have been struggling with this problem for a very, 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 very long time? <laughs> right? Isn't that ironic? And that's exactly what happens. Or anything that you resist shall persist. So for example, if procrastination is my issue, F Frank is no longer another human being, but Frank is that part of me who is a procrastinator. And so I won't push you over. I couldn't anyway. You're the stronger of the two. Okay? So I keep pushing. I say, I hate the fact that I'm a procrastinator. I'm not going to procrastinate anymore. I have a New Year resolution. I'm going to get all my stuff done on time. I hate procrastination. Procrastination, go away. No more procrastination. Notice that the harder I push against that part of me that procrastinates, I cause that part of me to react and push back against me. Anything that you resist shall persist is the adage. Anything that you resist shall persist. So what happens is that in many areas of our life, we find things that we don't like about ourselves, we start pushing against it. And when you start pushing against it, it pushes back. For example, I told you that I've become emotionally abusive. As an emotionally abusive person and as somebody who loses his temper, at inopportune moments. What if I got really mad at me for being an emotionally abusive person and for losing my temper? I hate the fact that I lost my temper at Blockbuster. Damn it. Can you see the irony of it all? What do you think is going to happen to my level of anger? Go up or come down? Increase. And the very source of my problem is a lot of repressed and suppressed anger. So it just gets exacerbated in that way. Instead, if I can let, accept myself for being a procrastinator, if I can accept myself for being an emotionally abusive person and bring compassion to myself, a very mysterious process of transformation starts happening, which is an inner revolution of immense magnitude. So for example, instead of pushing against Frank, the part of me that procrastinates, I accept that I'm a procrastinator and don't try to change it. Now, this is very hard to do because the moment you see something inside you that you don't like, instinctively you try to fix it. Now, the Eastern mystics like Osho give you a very different approach to inner transformation. And they say, don't try to change, just accept yourself the way you are with all your strengths and weaknesses. And just from that acceptance, self-acceptance, something will happen. Transformation will happen. 
not as a rationally and deliberately and consciously and intentionally engineered process, but as an unfolding of a beautiful organic um, uh, progression. So, but how do you do that? Now, it's hard to accept yourself when you see something. How many of you would agree that if you look within and you see something you don't wrong, you'd find it very difficult to sit back and say, I just accept myself, right? Now, there are two paths that Osho provides us, among many others, to get to that place of acceptance. The first is the path of humor, okay? Okay, once again, folks, all of those who self-identified yourself as procrastinators, raise your hand. Okay, put your hand down. All of you who get your stuff done on time, raise your hand. And folks, do you recognize procrastinators that you're actually helping to make the world a happier place? How would all those people who raise their hand, who get their shit done on time, feel special and good about themselves if we weren't there to make them look good? It's in contrast. They'll say, Param, RBY says, Param never gets his performance report turned in time to the dean, but I got my thing done on time. He can feel good. I, as a procrastinator, help all those people who get their shit done on time really feel happy. So I'm making a contribution to human happiness. So celebrate that and acknowledge that. If nature or God or whoever you believe in has created you as a procrastinator, who are you to go against nature's creation? Do you want to go against the creator, against the Lord himself? No. Respect the Lord. He's made you a procrastinator. Joyously accept and inhabit that space. Right? Now, the path, another thing, of the path of humor. You know, I teach evening MBA classes. Where people like Daryl take classes. Right? And I ask people, you know, you work during the day and you take classes in the night. What pisses you off most at work? You know, guess what the most frequent answer in American companies is? Lazy people. I hate lazy people. I hate people who don't pull their weight. How many of you here hate lazy people? Come on, right? Now, this is a very peculiar American phenomenon. I come from India where we are perfectly happy with lazy people. I'll tell you why. Because we are a being-oriented culture. But really, it is this. Osho says, why are you so pissed off at lazy people? Do you realize that all the terrible things that have been done to this world have not been done by lazy people? They have been done by very hardworking people. <laughs> Folks, guess who was very hardworking? Hitler himself. <laughs> With Benito Mussolini. All these were very hardworking people. Stalin was a very hardworking man. And guess who else was very hardworking? Mr. Jeffrey Dahmer. He stalked people and killed them, but he was extremely hardworking. Notice, the hardworking people are the ones to be, are dangerous people who have to be feared. No lazy person, even serial killers are hardworking. Lazy people may screw up their own scene in life, but that's the radius of damage. <laughs> they don't go around messing up, you know, starting wars, killing people. All this is the result of hardworking people. Fear the hardworking people, says Osho. Besides, I ask people, okay, you're in the MBA program, what's your job objective? Most MBAs, Laura, would you say when you were an MBA, your objective was to be a supervisor or a manager? Most people say, I want to be a manager or supervisor. Then I say, you know what? If you hate hardworking people and you don't want them around, I mean, lazy people and you don't want them around, you have just talked your way out of a job. Do you know why companies need managers? Because some people don't get their shit done at all. <laughs> if you eliminated all lazy people, companies would eliminate all managers. You wouldn't have a job after your MBA. There's nothing that you'd be trained for that you could apply. Out of work. So I say on Valentine's Day, order chocolates and flowers, roses, take it to every lazy person on your team and say, thank you. Thank you for being a lazy person. Because without you, I would not have a job. Celebrate that. So that's the path of humor, right? Now, I want to show you the alternative path that Osho talks about, which is a more spiritual path rooted in naturalistic ecology, in nature. So this says that Osho reminds us that we construct things as opposites because we are um, victims of language. Language creates opposites. For example, if I give you the Webster Dictionary, or any dictionary for that matter, and I ask you, what's the opposite of the word peak? What would you tell me is the opposite of the word peak? Valley. valley. But Osho reminds us, peaks and valleys are not opposites. If you go out into nature, every peak creates a valley. 
peaks and valleys go hand in hand. Why the hell do you think they're opposites? Simply because that's what the dictionary told us. Our mind creates polarizations that are not real, that are not truly reflective of the nature of reality. Reality is dialectical, not polarized or paradoxical. It's dialectical. Each one leads to the other. So the peak leads to the valley. Well, how many of us here want to be successful and don't want to deal with failure? Almost an impossibility. If the idea of success exists, it's because the idea of failure also exists. Success is like the peak, valley is like the failure. You can't say, I just want successes, which says, I just want the peaks. Well, the peak exists because there's a valley, so how could you ask for only success? Nature has many deep lessons like this. Peaks and valleys go together. What's the opposite of day? Night. Is it really? Not quite. Day and night follow each other. They're connected. They're interconnected. So it is with love and hate. If you don't believe me, try this one on. Folks, if there's at least one person in, in your life that you love deeply, raise your hand. Come on, everybody, raise your hand if you at least love one person deeply. How many of you would agree that you also hate that person deeply? <laughs> Isn't that an aha? Uh -huh? Think about it. You know, we think you love the person, you can't hate the person. The people that we love, we also have moments where we can hate them deeply. Love and hate are not opposites that can coexist in the world, in the universe, in nature, they coexist. The people that we love, we also hate. And therefore, but we construct this as an opposite. Those guy things can occur together. And of course, in life, I don't think many marriages would happen, which means many divorces also wouldn't happen as a corollary. If you went and proposed to people and said, would you marry me because I love you and I hate you? <laughs> right? But in order to, because that uh, proposal wouldn't take you very far, okay? In retrospect, it would have saved you a lot of damage, but you don't have access to that wisdom right then. So you want to use your persuasive capacities and say, I love you, and you get married. The opposites are not really opposites. They're complementarities. But language creates those opposites. And therefore, to become vigilant, understand from nature that everything is beautifully connected. But without access to that wisdom of the fundamental interconnectivity of everything, everything is flowing into everything, we create these inner wars. We start fighting with parts of ourselves. A piece of homework for you from the seminar, go home and think of all those struggles, those parts of you that you haven't accepted fully, and try a different method. For example, let me rewind the tape back to the time I discovered that I had become emotionally abusive and had anger management problems. At that time, there are three things that you do. One, you have to first acquire some insight into how you became that way. Now, that insight doesn't have to be a scientific truth. It's almost like being a pop psychologist. I go back down memory lane and I remember, oh, I used to uh, you know, be called as, thought of as mentally deficient. And in order to be lovable, I just started acting very sweet and nice and suppressing myself. I try to gain some insight. That's the first thing. The second thing is acceptance. Accept yourself the way you are. Because if you start change, trying to change something, anything that you resist shall persist. It will push back. Instead, accept yourself the way you are. Three, have compassion for yourself. Folks, how many of you would agree, if I discover that I'm emotionally abusive to others, it's much easier for me to have compassion for others who are the victims of my abuse and very hard to have compassion for myself. Would you agree? That's the place at which you have to bring tremendous love and compassion to yourself. Because love is the engine of healing. If you can love yourself at a very deep level for who you are, just the way you are, there's a tremendous inner revolution happens. And from that place of inner acceptance, many of your secondary level symptoms will just dissipate. But that's the fundamental relationship that is broken in our life. And it's broken because so much of the parental love that we receive is really not unconditional love. It is very conditional. It is very temporary. People will even punch you in your face when you're a child and say it's because they love you. Go figure, right? And we rationalize. And it's so conditional that often we have made our sense of self-acceptance dependent upon something. And therefore, we don't give ourselves the luxury of accessing, accepting ourselves just the way we are, with all our faults and limitations. Imagine. Think about ever since childhood, would you agree that the number of internal messages that you've received are more negative than positive? 
the way you hold your fork is wrong. You're spilling your food while you're eating. Why aren't you wearing your apron properly? I've been trying to toilet train you and you just chat your pants. Uh, you don't talk to your neighbors in a friendly enough way and you don't share your toys. What is wrong with you? And why are you late again to school? Why didn't you make your bed when you woke up? If you add up the sum total of communications directed at you, how many of you would agree that there's a serious imbalance in terms of criticisms to affirmation? It is no wonder that most of us hate ourselves. And it is amazing. Those, and I've been doing a little bit of uh, layman slash anthropological research. Those societies in which children get a very different message. So in the doing oriented cultures, children get the message I want you to get good grades, which means who you are, just the way you are, is not good enough. Inside them, a deep contingency or dependence is created between accessing self-acceptance and doing great things. So you can never just accept yourself unconditionally. The happiest and most relaxed cultures are the ones where children are given the message, who you are, just the way you are, is beautiful. Children are celebrated just for being children, not that they have to do all this and then they become lovable. So that self-acceptance which for many of us was denied, it's never too late. Start accepting and rejoicing in who you are. Fall in love with yourself just the way you are because that love will heal you. Just from accepting the fact that I was abusive and not trying to change it, I have, as I said, my temper is completely gone and nothing ever provokes me. And not only that, just from accepting myself and loving myself for who I am not and who I am, I have more insight, I have compassion for myself, and my ability to love others increases. One of the th themes that I explore in my classes is the manager as a healing presence. How many of you would agree that in these turbulent times, people that you meet are under tremendous levels of personal, financial, emotional, uh, marital stress? You just don't know what people are going through. They're in tremendous pain. And if you can be a healing presence to them, it's just amazing what a healing environment you can create in your workplaces. But you cannot be a healing presence to anybody unless you have healed from these own wounds, your own wounds yourself. You have to deal with these psychological injuries that you carry from childhood and love and accept yourself for who you are. Because when you um, bestow love and compassion upon yourself, a healing process starts and then you become a very gentle person. I've seen people go through this revolution of inner consciousness. When they start accepting and loving themselves, the way they look at you is different. The, the, the tone modulation of voice acquires a softness. They become very graceful in even how they shake hands with you, how they give you a hug. Your entire inner configuration undergoes a dramatic transformation of an acceptance. Folks, how many of you would agree that among all the people that you interact on an everyday basis, there's a wide continuum in terms of experiencing gentleness and healingness, right? And that's the journey I'm talking about, a kind softness towards oneself. Now, here again, I want to distinguish between two different paradigmatic differences. There is the paradigm of perfection upon which most of our Western education is based. It's the idea that there are parts of you that are good and there are parts of you that are bad. Your job is to consolidate the good parts and to change the bad parts. So you declare a war on the bad parts and you try to eliminate them. You become perfectionistic. How many of you here have had enough, have suffered enough in life from your own perfectionism? Raise your hand. You've known the pain of perfectionism. A very gentle alternative is called the path of totality. It comes from the Eastern tradition of Taoism founded by Lao Tzu and um, people like that. It says, don't strive for perfection, but for totality. Accept the whole, the totality of who you are. Accept the fact that you're kind, accept the fact that you're hateful, accept the fact that you succeed, accept the fact that you fail, accept the fact that you're hardworking, accept the fact that you're lazy. Accept both sides. When you can embrace yourself in your totality and you start becoming very compassionate and peaceful and that inner peace enables you to transcend the duality the challenge is to transcend the duality. The duality is constructing these opposites, love and hate. If you can accept both of them, you rise. It's almost like imagine two bases of a triangle, love and hate, right, in opposition. You actually go to the apex and occupy a position where you've transcended the duality. You can see the part of you that's hateful, see the part of you that's loving, and gently accept both. 
How many of you can feel that when you accept the part of you that is hateful, that hateful part itself will start losing its sharpness and will become loving? How many of you were tracking with me there, right? And that's what happens. Acceptance, self-acceptance, helping children around you. Spread this among your families to help people accept and love and enjoy themselves for who they are. There's very little that we do in our lives 